Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, uh, yeah, I was actually hoping to give uh, my first lecture in Italian uh, because I'm actually from uh, Lugano, not far from here originally. Um, uh, but actually, I'm just joking. I wouldn't be able to give a lecture in Italian. I mean, it wouldn't. All the scientific terms would not work. So uh, I will talk uh, about uh, autoregressive uh, image models, um, and it's um, it's a statistical subject, but obviously uh, there are. It's also a very computational one. So. Um, especially in the first part of the talk, when we talk about sort of the more foundational aspects um, of, the, of the models and of the subject, um, it's nice if you think about, you know, uh, really the algorithmic computational aspects of it. Um, so, uh, so it's actually really exciting to talk about image models. When I, uh, even when I agreed to give this talk some months ago, uh, the these image models have, were already going viral, but it's just been going upwards from, from since then, right? So if you follow Twitter uh, or any of these, uh, or even the news, uh, these models have just been going, just are becoming better and better and better. And when, when we started working on these things uh, seven, uh, eight years ago, the samples looked like, looked like this. You know, you have like a toilet seats open in the grass field. Uh, that's how the samples looked like. And that was just uh, seven years ago. And um, it seemed almost impossible that today you could produce a sample like that. So the, the change in the field has been just enormous. Um, and um, once you actually reach something like this, uh, these models actually become useful, commercially useful uh, for all kinds of um, uh, graphics or marketing or anything you imagine. So it's really exploding right now, the whole field, and it's a perfect time to talk about it. Um, uh, okay, so just a quick uh, outline of the talk. Uh, we'll talk about the foundations of autoregressive models first. Um, then we address one of the uh, important, uh, one of the main difficulties of these models, which is the sampling speed. And we'll talk about efficient sampling techniques. And then we'll talk about some state of the art models uh, and latent uh, spaces for AR models. Uh, and please do ask me questions. I actually really like this to be interactive. So any question you have, uh, please just uh, feel free to interrupt me. I really don't mind. Um, so you already had a, question, uh, a lecture on, on images, but uh, the representation of images for autoregressive models is perhaps uh, rather crucial uh, compared to some other models, more crucial here in, in, in other approaches. And so it's worth to have a look at it again. Images are basically just matrices, uh, tensors, 2D matrices um, of R, G, and B values. And uh, R, G, B stands for red, green, and blue. And it's basically, the, these are the primary colors of light. Um, and it's actually funny because in high school sometimes teach, they teach you that the primary colors are, you know, cyan, magenta, and yellow. Um, and well, they turn out to be the primary colors of paint, which is different from light. Uh, it's a funny fact, but actually now it all makes sense. Um, and this color wheel, you can see how things combine. The important thing is that all these images today, basically, are represented with these three channels uh, as matrices, like you can see, and every square, every little cube has eight bits of information. Um, and basically, so it takes values from zero to 256. Um, and, um, and to get to, uh, together, you can, you can uh, make around 16, uh, 16 and a half million colors. And that's basically how every display uh, works. You could, actually, there's, there's some cameras who have uh, you know, more bits and stuff. But, but you know, overall, this is how everything that you, can, that you use on your phones and everything works, basically. The goal of autoregressive modeling uh, is, in, in, in principle, is to model every little bit that you see here. Um, Oh, that's, that's the supposed capability of these models. Now, now of course, it's, it's, it gets tricky, uh, and we'll talk about this. With images, a lot of these bits are a little bit, uh, they don't influence the visual aspect so much. But at least for the first part of the talk, we kind of want to model everything, every little bit of information. Uh, and later, we'll see how some of these things can be uh, avoided. So let's going sort of kind of down to the basics, you know, how would you actually do that? Well, um, and even going before deep learning, you know, um, for just a very short, very short slide, 
How would you actually do this and what are the difficulties? Because we should never make things more complicated than they're necessary. Um, deep learning being the simplest. Um, <laughs> that was a trick um, But so imagine you have a picture like this. It's actually, actually imagine this is your data set and you want to model that, right? Well, one thing you could do, for example, is to uh, start looking at bigrams, small sequences of, of pixels and pixel colors. And you would, for example, see that, you know, things like this would be very frequent, you know, uh, dark red to red, uh, red to orange, yellow to orange, and of course, green to green, or this color because of the background. And you'll get uh, somewhat frequent uh, bigrams, like these ones. Um, and you also get very infrequent, uh, very infrequent ones, like these ones. So blue, and blue doesn't even appear, so if this was your data set, you wouldn't even see them. The, this, actually, this type of coding, I think, is actually used, some, this type of models based on uh, this little pixel and pixel pairs, is actually used in some, in some, uh, in some, in some uh, um, coding models. Uh, but uh, there is, uh, you know, you can start doing this, and you would have a whole bunch of counts, but you would slowly start getting into like sparsity issues. And most importantly, these bigrams, they're not actually formatted enough for the image. What you really want is start, uh, is actually start collecting information about large pieces, uh, large blocks of, 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 of pixels, and think about sort of what, you know, um, based on them, what sort of, what would come next, based on this, on this context. Um, but this counts when you go from bigrams to like such large chunks. And by the way, when you, uh, to, from, sorry, from, sequ from pairs of pixels to such large chunks, um, of course, the, you, the sparsity problem that you had in this case actually increases exponentially. And um, suddenly, um, you start collecting all the statistics. And first of all, you have a lot of zeros, because many things just don't appear. Um, and secondly, um, also, you're going to have what's called the course of dimensionality. Um, the, you're going to have an exponential blow up in the combinatorial possibilities of all these, of all these uh, pixel combinations. However, an approach like this could technically allow you to estimate uh, the probabilities of various things in your image. Um, but here is kind of like my, the, the kind of important thing. I, I went through this a little bit fast, but here's the important thing. This course of sparsity and this course of dimensionality is kind of what deep learning models sort of solve, um, at least from this perspective. And this is actually crucial. Because if you imagine having this giant table of all these um, contexts and trying to predict what comes next and have the counts, um, you, uh, uh, you start realizing you have all these, sparse, all these sparse information. But if you start feeding them to a neural network, what happens is that these counts actually have to be compressed in these layers, uh, linear, nonlinear. And um, so, so you get something, so, you, you, so it, instead, of, instead of like trying to build a big table uh, that would have been full of zeros, you start thinking about how you would feed this information to neural network to predict the next, imp the next uh, part of the model, next pixel in the sequence or the context. And, you, you, and, and, and suddenly you don't have zeros anymore. And most importantly, you get a lot of compression in these layers, right? So you, start, you, ha you, ha you have these inputs and they go through layers and we'll explain how this works in detail, of course. Um, and the sparsity disappears, the dimensionality disappears because the neural network can take these big chunks of information and, and make a prediction as to what's the next pixel. Um, and, um, and that's actually how learning works. And that's actually the magic of, of deep learning, this ability to basically get around the curses of sparsity and dimensionality. Um, and, that's, and, that, and, if, and it's actually not what, it's, we know it works, uh, but it keeps on surprising us because that's one of the reasons why it works so well. So the whole talk today will be about what type of, uh, the first part, will be what type of architectures allow us to take uh, information that looks like this image, all the different contexts to generate various uh, outputs. And um, of course I should have said that, but when we predict the next thing in these, uh, in, in these models to then be able to generate them one piece at a time, all these bits, we use a distribution like from zero to 255 over all the possible outputs, and we'll come, uh, I'll come back to it again. So uh, this was implicit in my conversation till now, but the core structure of autoregressive models is to predict all these bits. We have to kind of predict all of them, and so we have to choose an order. Um, and the, it turns out that most orders are equivalent, 
but the standard order has been used for these models is uh, left to right, top to bottom. So you have an image, and imagine this could be much bigger than uh, eight by eight, and you start at, uh, you first generate the first um, R, uh, RGB value, the first actually first value of say red, and then the second value of the red channel, and so on, up to 64 steps one by one, um, and that feels slow, but we'll talk about that. Uh, and then, so you generate R, G, and, and then conditional on the first generation of R, you generate G and generate B. Um, so you actually do this three times for an image of A by 8. Um, and what, so you could do this with these pixel uh, engrams, but actually we're going to do a neural, net, neural network, of course. So at every step, you have an evaluation of a neural network going from here all the way to there. Um, the... So we talked about these, these, these pieces of information that help us, this context, that help us to predict what comes next. In the, the most generic sense, when you predict the next thing, you want to be able to embed everything that has been generated before. So when you predict the, the 36th, say, pixel in this image, you want to actually have a context over everything that comes before. And, the, and, and again, see, here, here you see the, how so this is a beautiful, beautiful idea. I mean, you, you kind of want to have everything comes before, but this is simply impossible in a uh, non, non deep learning approach. I mean, you have these enormous, again, these enormous tables just full of zeros because most things just don't appear in your data. And you can do smoothing and stuff like that, but actually that just reduces the number of, uh, affect the number of bits. So, um, so, but we want, an, we want an architecture that can efficiently as well capture this whole context when we predict the next thing. That's the goal. So, um, and so let's talk about how can, can this be done. Please do ask me a question if I'm, if I'm, seeing, seeing, uh, if I'm not uh, capturing some details. Um, another important thing before we go into the architectures is the output distribution. And there was actually a lot of talk about this. You know, these RGB values are contiguous. They go from zero to 55, they're actually intensity values. And so there, there are many priors you can have on these values that capture this contiguity uh, very well. Um, but uh, for learning reasons, and also because actually sometimes you want to have very multimodal outputs, sometimes the value that comes next could be uh, many different things. It doesn't have to be just one specific thing. Uh, it's actually convenient to just have a categorical, categorical distribution over around 255 uh, values, and each of them are basically separate buckets. And um, you might wonder, well, isn't that a super bad idea? Are we, are we making the problem harder because we're not telling the network that these values are actually similar to each other? But actually, it turns out that um, the network learns this contiguity in a few gradient, ups, uh, gradient steps. And, um, and, and then all the other advantages of having a softmax, lo softmax loss sort of appear. You're all familiar with softmax losses, right? You've seen it somewhere. Um, it's, it's common in natural language processing and everywhere. So uh, for, for a bunch of models, actually for basically all autoregressive models in this talk, they are going to have a softmax loss over pixel values or latent value variables, but that's sort of the idea. Okay, so we want to capture this context, uh, and we're going to go be down to the foundations of some operator, operations that can actually capture this context efficiently. Uh, as I said, we have this uh, 36th pixel that we want to capture context for it, but um, the learning efficiency also matters, so we want to do this for every pixel in the image at the same time. So when we embed this context into our network, we want to, do, we want to uh, embed the context for all the pixels at the same time while we train. Otherwise, we'll be, we, we, the training will be very inefficient. Um, you can actually imagine doing the inefficient, inefficient thing and actually cut out from your image different uh, co uh, contexts around it and sort of train one by one. And actually, you can, you can experiment with that, but it just turns out to be much, much uh, slower. So we need an operation that can capture all contexts at once without cheating, without seeing the future. The mass convolution is this idea. It's like a convolution, it's a convolution layer, 2D convolution. Uh, but it masks the current pixel. It masks, in, so this, this will be a 3, three, three by 3 convolution that masks the current pixel mass the pixel uh, to, the, to the right of the current one and the three one in the bottom. And so you actually get a context that looks like this. Uh, so this is the pixel you want to predict. You have 
uh, create a context around this pixel or, or L-shaped context, and you don't, uh, you're not seeing these other pixels either, and also not, its own, not, not itself. So then the model, you can take the image as an input, uh, the raw image, you can apply this convolution, um, many layers of it, many, many times, and grow this kind of context around the pixel that we want to generate. And because of, this, because of this clever masking procedure, you can actually do it for every pixel. Now, this is, a, this is basically equivalent in two dimensions to the masking that you've seen, transfor that you've seen I'm sure, in Transformers and LP that other, uh, that other uh, speakers have definitely talked about, except it's in two dimensions. Um, and the reason why it's efficient there is the same reason why it's efficient here. Uh, and you actually, in NLP, to, uh, as I hope you spoke about it, but to, to make a connection, you could also imagine just, you know, the, the causal masking in transformers is one way to go from context to the next token in the, in the, in the sequence. Um, you could do this without the causal masking and have the, the direct models. And some people, sometimes people actually experimented with them. But the, co the causal masking makes things efficient, creates state sharing across different layers of the network, and, and speeds things up in both cases, in the 1D and the 2D case. Um, any questions? No. Good. Um, in the 2D uh, case, however, uh, as opposed to the, the 1D case, you actually create a blind spot. And um, this red part is, uh, actually, there's a small typo. Technically, uh, the lowest line should be white. You, you, the, the part you generated, the red part up there without the lowest line, um, is actually something you've generated. So it's something that when you're generating the next token is uh, very um, important to know, uh, or at least to some extent. Yes. We have a question. Ah, yes, please. Yeah. Hi, excuse me. I was wondering about the initialization of the first pixel then, because we are not using the ones from the future uh, and from the future. Uh, is it uh, initialization uh, randomly or is there some methods of initialization? Yes. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. There's, there's a lot of details in these models that I'm sort of, I'm, I'm skipping over to focus on some of them and this is one of the details. So what happens on the first pixel, actually, usually the distribution looks like this, the first, this first quadrant. Uh, this one here. Um, so it's not random. The model will basically just take a bunch of biases, no inputs. If you do the convolutional thing, it just takes no inputs, just sees empty context. And then, it will, and then on, on train on image net with an actual most data sets, you're going to see something like this. Uh, that's for the R value, the very first red channel. Um, and what you see is basically uniform, except for values of 0 and 255. And 0 is uh, no, no lightness, so dark, uh, no red and 255 is all red. And when you put all, all red, all green, or blue, you get white. So there's actually a preference for the zeroth, zeroth value and the 255th value. Um, I guess they appear more than others. Uh, otherwise, it's basically uniform. That's what the question. So back to the blind spot. We have this blind spot. Um, it's actually a bit annoying. Uh, that there's a typo here. But basically, these uh, six values have, are not being considered when we estimate this, uh, this pixel here. To make the situation look a little bit worse, imagine you have this big picture that we talked about again. And you have to, you know, row by row, uh, in principle, predict every little value here. But you get here, and you don't, you, like your model is predicting the next value and doesn't see a whole bunch of information. To be completely fair, it still sees a lot of information, right? So it's, it's, it's not bad. But if you're really, really uh, precise, we're missing some information here. And most importantly, we're missing some of the closest context around here, just around above the current, uh, current row around this, around this point. Clo uh, the near, nearest context is the most statistically important in estimating uh, pixel values just like it is for language. You know, in language, the, the nearest context before a word is, has the highest statistical impact on the current word. Um, and uh, so you, you definitely don't want to lose that. Uh, however, at the same time, if you go very much in the back, you go you know, hundreds of pixels away in, in two-dimensional directions, the statistical uh, weight of that is very low. So, 
So, um, so in general, we, we want to capture all the context, but we also want to think about when we don't capture context, whether we can do something about it and come back to this. So pixel CNN was a model that was proposed to do this, but then there were ideas, you know, how do we fix this blind spot? Um, there is one uh, trick that was subsequently proposed, and uh, it's, in retrospect, of course, it's, in hindsight, it's very easy, but um, back then, because of all this efficiency and, and all this, and, and, you know, and training speed always matters, back then it, it felt like a nice solution. Um, you basically have two convolutions. One that is like a 1D convolution here, where basically you're capturing the previous contours of the current row. And then you have another masking pattern for just the things above. And, and in every block of your, of your deep network that you're, at, that you're stacking, at every layer you actually have to shift these, these representations down by one and, uh, and, and connect to the representation of this pixel here. And when you do this, you, at least on paper, technically you capture the whole context that you care about. All this is done with convolutions. Now, convolutions have sort of gone out of, out of uh, uh, favor a bit uh, because of all the talk about transformers in the past three, four years, and that's for good reasons. Um, but there are some places in extremely large, especially large images, and all these models actually, the decoding to a large image and the encoding and all these things are always done with convolutions, even to this, almost always done with convolutions into this day. Because there's an efficiency in the operation that is just so hard to, 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 you know, you just can't be faster than convolutions on, on large 2D spaces, basically. I mean, there are some asterisks. So with convolution, with two convolutions, one on 1D and one in 2D space, you can actually kind of capture the whole context and get a good estimation of your context for every pixel at the same time. Um, uh, I want, uh, now, this is, this is sort of with how it's done with convolutions. Um, but for kind of historical purposes, and, and um, I also want to give a bit more uh, context how this is done with other models, how this was done with other models, and attention is one of them. After self-attention was published for machine translation, people started thinking, okay, how do we solve this problem um, of, of autogressive gener generation with uh, something like an attention model? And this was one of the first solutions. Um, and what you can see here, this is a little bit more complicated. Uh, you've all had the electron transformers, so I'm sure you can understand the difference between query and memories. Um, but it's um, running self, so linearizing, running self attention, the whole image will be way too expensive if your image has about 3,000 tokens or so. So these authors of this paper, what they did actually was to try to cut down the image in different query, in non overlapping query uh, portions like these query blocks, and in overlapping memory blocks. And basically what happens is that you can then, from, for this pixel here, you basically query this, you see this context here, you query this context of this size. And for each of these pixels, you query, query the same context. And there is, no, there is no moving one by one, this is actually fixed context. And the reason you need to do this is because of self-attention, because the way it's defined. It, it's very difficult to do local self-attention that slides by each window like a convolution efficiently. It's very hard to do that. It's very hard to implement that. So, technically, so basically, you kind of have to cut up the image into various parts, into memory blocks and query blocks, and then attend with them uh, separately. Now, uh, this, so this is, uh, so this doesn't, well, um, uh, you have to be, um, uh, I think, a little bit careful. Here you actually get the full context uh, in terms of the previous picture because you apply multiple layers of this. You do it many times. Uh, this will also look into the, these queries here. We look into the previous ones to so actually cover the whole context. Um, in this case, I'm actually not entirely sure. Uh, I've never really wondered too much, but maybe, that, maybe there's actually a blind spot. But this was kind of like one of the first attempts with self-attention to, 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 to solve this problem, the, the generative problem. And the advantage of convolutions, of course, there's a cost, maybe uh, it's complications, but the advantage is, of course, you can sort of retrieve, you know, your, your kernel size is very big. It covers a big context, all, all, that, all the attention features, which are a big advantage. So this is one way of doing it. Um, I also want to cover another way of capturing the whole, uh, the, the whole space with attention in a rather simple way. And uh, besides kind of showing this, what's important here is that um, I want to sort of, I'll come back to this, why, why, why kind of breaking things apart uh, actually helps with the efficiency of these models. 
But another way of doing, uh, of, of capturing this whole context, like you, like you see here, is kind of to break things down. So first you're gonna have a, an encoder that only works for RGB channels. And, um, and in this case, um, the authors here use a one-dimensional attention. So one-dimensional self-attention, and that's all they do. They don't do two-dimensional two ones, they just use one-dimensional ones, and they go by the, by the axis, so row or column. And, um, uh, and they also factor, so you, you take all these RGB values they have to, you have to produce, but then you kind of break them apart as much as possible to basically minimize the network, the network part that needs to run for every RGB pixel, for every, uh, every RGB value. Because when we minimize them, you actually gain also on efficiency. We'll talk about this uh, in detail shortly. But um, so, so one way to actually get around this problem is you have these RGB values. You have an encoder which just is, there's no masking at all. It just captures with this crisscross pattern, you capture the whole, the whole input, the whole previous channels. Then you have one part which, where the goal is to capture everything above it. And this is basically the same trick as in, in conditional pixel CNN, but except it's applied only once, not at every layer. But you, you, um, you, you, you have this full row attention and half column attention, and you applied many, many times on this part of the network. So, uh, so after you build the context of previous channels, this allows you to build the context above the current point completely. And you can see here how you, like you build the context of previous channels, you build the context above, above the current point, all of it. You shift down everything for, uh, it's actually a, a way of masking. And then you finally build out the context of the last part. And, and you generate and generate the pixel. The most important thing here is really that this part will generate, that, that runs the most times, is actually uh, run, uh, it's actually smaller, it's only about four layers. And uh, you can get good results basically by doing much less, much less sort of, pure, pure steps uh, uh, in, in a row. Um, so local self-attention and this access of attention with this sort of factor, this sort of like uh, separation of different parts of the network are a couple of ways of accomplishing the same problem, uh, the same 2D generation problem with self-attention, not just convolutions. Um, now, I, oops, I, I sh oops, sorry, this is taking a while. I showed you the history of the past seven years, how we got from like some relatively bad samples to some good ones. And in my talk, these are these uh, early papers from the 2016, 2017, 2018, they still have samples which are, which are um, not too great. Back then they looked great. You know, these this conditional images, we could already see a bear. They were tiny, by the way, because com computers were expensive and we were not running things on gigantic pods. Um, uh, gigantic uh, sets of, of, of GPUs and, and TPUs. Um, it was still amazing to actually see a like brown bear to see sort of like a bear. You know, that was kind of like amazing back then. Um, but, but, you know, it's funny because it still felt like unless they're perfect or nearly perfect, they won't be useful to society <laughs> or to the world. So it was, it was great to see these results, but also like, hmm, you know, like, this is just too, too tough. And then the other thing that Mikhail, I'm sure she spoke about uh, a lot about guns. Um, also guns, this, these years, 2017, 18, 19, will become extremely popular and um, their samples looked great. So also for the autoregressive models, like, mm, you know, it's so much work for get, to get this stuff out. Um, yeah, questions? No. Um, and it just felt like, um, you know, just like, like uh, we are years or like, you know, eons away from, uh, from, from actually making this useful. Um, and, and that's actually the thing about deep learning. Like, it's very, it's, it's kind of like the, the, it, the progress is both slower and faster than we expect at the same time. So, uh, so this is some conditional image generations uh, on ImageNet. Okay, another, another important, important point here, this is one million samples. We'll talk about data, si data set size as well. This is training on about one million images uh, with the method I just showed, this, this is convolutional. Uh, things will change when, when you make this 100 times bigger or 1,000 times bigger. Um, and to give a sense about videos, you, you can't really see, but um, um, on this uh, robot pushing data set where you sort of have a robot hand that pushes things around, um, uh, doing this with these type of models directly on pixels was getting roughly the quality of, of videos um, that you can see here, 2018. 
Now, video models are actually, uh, right now, the hype and the virality is around image models, uh, and you can text to image models. And, and it, you can do really amazing things, and it's really fun. Um, and text to video models are the next thing, and they will probably happen very soon uh, to have pretty awesome, like, TikTok like videos, um, you know, maybe a couple of years. Uh, assuming the data is there, but I think it's there, people figured out. Um, so, so, that's, so, that's, so that's happening. Yeah, it's a bit scary. Um, okay. So this is basically as much I want to say about the sort of the foundations, about the idea of raster scan generation, and some basic architectures, convolution, attentional models uh, for, for, for autogressive generation two dimensions. If you have any questions, otherwise we'll, uh, we'll move on to the next section. Great. OK, now, um, one of the, uh, how am I doing on time, actually? I'm interested to know. OK. Oh, it's already 45 minutes. OK. Um, one of the, OK, I actually have to speed up. That's amazing. So um, one, of the, um, the, one of the problems of, of, of these models, indeed, is the latency. And I want, to, I want to tell you about a few techniques here how to make this much, much faster. Um, I'm actually kind of bullish about this. I think in most cases you can get the speed that you need. So, um, okay, first of all, like in transformers, one thing you want to do is you want to, when you, when you generate from these models, you want to sort of maintain the previous states that you generated. So when you generate a pixel, um, you, go, you go through this, all the states that you had to generate to get to the next one, and you don't want to run the whole 2D image again. You want to, you want to preserve the previous states. Now, the important, the, the, actually, the big advantage of autogressive models is that if you think about it, the number of flops that you need to generate the whole image is just the number of flops you need to do a forward propagation to the whole model. And the reason why it's important is that, and that's actually the same, same in GANs, but in some models, actually, is much more. Uh, Tim will talk about them. Some, often, sometimes much more. So the number of these models are actually extremely efficient, or as efficient as it gets, when you count flops. They're just inefficient when you think about the implementation. Uh, or when you, when you want to, when you have, because you have a, a whole lot of sort of small operations, and these small operations, a lot of sequentially small operations, are just not great for things like GPUs and TPUs. Because every time you run on these operations, you actually have to launch a kernel, load things in the memory of the GPU, in the, in the very, on the on-chip the on uh, memory of all the chips on the GPU, and, and that just slow, that slows things down. Um, now, there are many ways of getting around it. One way is to implement this very efficiently. But that is sort of like operation specific. You have these special kernels that is operation specific, but anyway, it's, it's not the most com co convenient one. And anyway, there's still limits even if you do that. So we want to think about how, besides, of course, reusing states, that's always important, how we can do this uh, pr process efficiently without, um, uh, without using kernels so much. Um, OK, this, is, this goes back to the, to the last thing I just said in the previous slide. One thing to do that generally will make these models much faster, uh, and you can also see this in machine translation sometimes. They have these models that have these very large encoders of the source sentence and a very tiny decoder on top. And kind of the same can be done here. You can sort of compress all the parallel stuff in one part of the network and have a small encoder on top. Um, now, these tricks that I'm talking about right now are actually kind of complementary. You can imagine putting them together. And, uh, and, and then make the result fa very fast. Another, tri another thing, which is actually a bit hard to implement, but this can be very effective, uh, and it's going to be probably more used as the expense of producing some of these things, the cost of these things actually becomes important, is sort of sparsity. Sparsifying weight matrices of neural networks is a very complicated topic, and it, 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 it sort of affects differently on different, it works differently on different hardware. So I'm not gonna go into depth to depth, but I just wanna give you the information here. If you're ever stuck on like a, you have to run a long sequence of operations very, very often on some um, hardware that is more like a CPU or something, you can think about sparsifying the weights. And the key here is that you can sparsify up to 90% or 95%, have extremely few flops, uh, and still get really, really good performance, have almost no hitting performance. Um, there, there's a whole issue of how to do this. I'm not gonna talk about this too much, but the idea basically is while you're training, you make sure a lot of your weights are zero, um, and you throw out weights and you let them come back in and so on. And you can also take block of weights in your, your network's matrices and put them all to zero together. But um, 
Just to give an idea, basically these type of techniques allowed for some audio synthesis models, which are also regressive, to run on your phone, on your phone CPU, at uh, you know 24,000 uh, steps per second on just your CPU, and it was like an RNN. So these are powerful techniques that if you really have to make things very fast at one point, uh, regressive, you can use. Another another cool trick um, that was kind of first discovered in the audio domain, but it's applicable to images, not used very much. But this is it's kind of uh, kind of interesting in this space. Is this idea of diagonal sampling? The, the deal is basically kind of dynamic programming, sort of, but for for autoregressive models, um, 2D, especially two D models in this case. And the what basically what this makes use of is that idea of a, um, a blind blind spot in the models, right? So. What you can actually imagine, you start generating the first row of your image, and before you end the first row, you start on the next row. But 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 you know you might interrupt me like wait now, but you you're talking about capturing the whole context. Well, yeah, we want to capture generally the whole context, but we've seen many models that have a blind spot, and you can and and also we can imagine that if the blind spot is kind of minimized and made rather small. And basically, very small. I'll show in a bit. Um, you can still get a very huge gain in the number of operations here by having a very tiny, tiny blind spot. And on top of that, even models with kind of like a big blind spot, which I don't like so much, but even those actually work pretty well. So especially if you're generating from like a super resolution point where you have a smaller image already, then a blind spot, even a larger one, doesn't have a big impact. Then you can apply this diagonal sampling algorithm. Uh, you can see here that we generate the whole image in 50 steps instead of 64, but uh, with a delay of one, two, three, four, five, six steps. But this is on a small image. On, a, on larger images, ah, this actually, I think, explains um, uh, the algorithm. So in the, in the convolutional case, um, because of this blind spot, uh, yeah, because of this blind spot, and, and because the red blind spot, you can already start, you can generate this pixel, uh, you can generate this pixel, sorry, and this one at the same time, because actually they don't depend on each other because of the red area. Now here again, the blind spot in the case was kind of big, and we want to solve it. But if, if the blind spot is actually kind of small, you can generate these two things at the same time, while also not hurting performance, also almost not at all, with a delay of say five steps in this case. Now let me, let me make this clear, even clearer. In this diagonal sampling algorithm, on 8 by 8 images, say, with a delay of 6 steps, you can go from 64 to 50, a very small improvement. But on 256 by 256 images, with a delay of 20 steps, 20 steps is a lot of statistical information. That means that the row above, you actually have all the 20 steps up for every row available to you, and you can get a 12x reduction in the number of, of, of steps of your decoder. So from 65,000 to 5,000, roughly, steps. If you go on a one, one megapixel image and you have a delay of 50, you can get a 20x reduction in the number of steps uh, in, the, in your decoder. Um, and on top of that, you're kind of batching the, the information in your networks. So actually what happens here is, um, is, also, pretty ha is also very GPU friendly. I think, I think when you do this, the, the, the time it takes you to generate, to generate an image, even autoregressively, with extremely few independence assumptions, uh, is not too far from what happens with a single forward pass. Maybe five times longer, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and here is just to bring the point home. This is the context that we saw before with, uh, with just a basic co conditional CNN with a very big blind spot. Okay, this might doesn't, doesn't look so nice, a bit annoying. Okay. Now, if you do this with delay of 35, this is a delay of two steps. Delay of 35 steps on this 700 by 700 image where you have a 20x improvement in, in, the, in the number of steps, in the generation steps, this is actually a blind spot. You can barely see it, right? Yeah, it feels a bit magical, actually. Um, now, I've got to tell you, this, this algorithm is not, not used very much. And it might be one day. I don't know. But, um, but it's obviously like it's free. Uh, like it, it, it kind of makes autoregressive sampling so much easier uh, and, uh, and kind of like it solves a huge chunk of, of the, one of the main problems of the model. So, you know, basically having all, you know, you can imagine like a tiny number of models, uh, of cases where 
generating this without knowing this was like a huge mistake or something. But it's basically possible. It's basically never it would never happen in such a case. So uh, so the diagonal sampling is a powerful technique. Um, I want to give you an idea. So this was actually initially applied in the audio domain. Um, I'm not going to talk about it. It's, 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 it's well generated audios, but you have to reshape. Um, and it kind of looks uh, again in a in a in a, uh, in a, a toy description. The audio domain looks like this. You are sort of you know with 15 steps, you're generating, generating many more steps. This is in the 1D case. Uh, in, the 2D, in the 2D case, I just showed you. But the whole speed up blows up when you have bigger images, uh, bigger images, and so on. So imagine taking diagonal sampling and say combining with the separation of the networks when you actually want to create a very efficient autogressive image model, you would already get a huge speed up over, over, the, over, over the normal baseline and ha basically have no, still have a CODR model. Finally, I want to talk about one last generation strategy that has become kind of popular recently, partly because of diffusion models. Um, and this is 2022. Let me check on time. Um, I have another 15 minutes or so. Um, so, um, oh, no, third, half an hour, I guess, yeah. Okay. Um, this is one last strategy I want to talk about. So, we've seen a lot of things in raster scan order, like left to right, top to bottom. And this kind of also touches upon, uh, upon the, the blind spot idea. Like, it sounds like, it seems like actually for images, you can generate things basically in parallel with a lot of broken dependencies. Uh, and still get a pretty neat result. Um, so this is not even trying to do what regressive models really do, which is sort of to capture the whole context and be kind of like the nice, the nice uh, student that captures the whole context. No, it really is sort of like generates things in parallel. And this is actually recent, uh, 2022. Um, and um, it's an exciting direction because the quality is quite good. Um, so what basically happens is uh, you start, you generate, you generate first a very small number of pixels. Um, then based on this pixel, generate the next number of pixels and next and next and next and next and next. And they all have a relatively no, small number of steps, maybe eight or 10. And um, you remove the pixels that had the lowest confidence. So uh, at every step. So, so basically you, you need a strategy to remove pixels. You need a strategy to sort, to sort them and remove them and choose only a certain number of pixels. That's what you want to do here. And, um, and basically the way it's done by these authors is basically to remove the pixels that have the, uh, the lowest confidence, where the, where the model is uncertain. And do this many, many times and you get something out like this little bird from this mess, uh, I guess, that is here. Now, one point is that, and this will be the subject of the next, of the last part of this talk, is that this is actually done in latent space. It's not done in, uh, in pixel space, it's done in latent space. Um, and that's a great segue into the next part of my talk. But you see how here with just eight forward passes of your model, you get basically your image. Uh, there's a lot of improvements here that can be done here. You could imagine like, um, having different policies, and there's some papers about this recently, just like a week ago, different policies on how to remove the pixels, how to prune things, um, but in just eight steps with no complicated losses, nothing too special, you get something like, like this out of the model. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, there's a, lot, lot, there's a lot, of, lot of potential here. Okay, now in principle, this is done in latent space, and I'll talk about this just now. Um, okay, so this is 2022, and these are actually conditional ImageNet samples. When you look at samples and evaluate samples, like if you want to do the, the real scholastic thing, you have to be really careful about data sets. You know, like we're going to see some amazing things uh, briefly today and in Tim's talk, and I'm sure Michaela showed you some amazing things, but it really matters what data sets you're using. And this is one million images. And so it's, it's actually very, very challenging. Um, I should, for example, these are um, ImageNet, conditional ImageNet images. So you just have a text, uh, you know, generated ImageNet. Um, and it's, this is done on one million things. So it actually is really impressive. This, I, if I believe, is comparable to what you've seen at the beginning of the talk, uh, or like after the talk with the conditional pixel CNN images. So this is basically comparable, comparable to that in terms of number of samples. So the improvement in this past four or five years, even with a fair game situation, has been really drastic. Um, yeah, one thing that, uh, I, I didn't address in this talk actually is mode coverage. Um, one point that these authors make specifically is that uh, the diversity in things like big gun, 
is much lower than the worst in, uh, in these uh, autoaggressive latent models. Um, and uh, I didn't have to make this point because the model, autoaggressive models are the ones that have the highest mode coverage of any model, basically, and the future models too. But, so they will cover everything that is in the data. In the simplest case, they, 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 they're going to try to learn every little bit in the data. So that's not really an issue. Great. Now, for the last and the third and last part of my talk, this last sentence that I said is indeed the key aspect of some of the recent developments in, in autoaggressive models. It hasn't even been about efficiency so much, about making it faster or stuff like that. It's really been about trying to not make them model every bit in the image. So basically, what was our assumption that we actually want to model every bit in the image? Much of these latest developments have been about not doing that. Um, now, this is fine for graphics. This is fine for any graphical, visual, marketing, useful, actually, case for these models. I think it's perfectly fine to just not model every data, every piece of data. But if you really care about modeling, um, if you really care about modeling, say, some scientific data, you could imagine modeling, I don't know, uh, weather forecasts or CT scans, um, then removing noise like you want it might not be the smartest thing to do. I mean, because you don't know what is noise, what is not. So removing bits that are important might not be the, 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 what you really want to do, might not be safe. Maybe you want to actually have a generative model that covers everything that is in the data. So latent space models will have, most of the time, remove some of this data, or in some way, there's a loss. So what do we want to do? We want to take these RGBs that we started from and actually create a smaller image. Uh, first of all, smaller, spatially smaller. Um, this is done because, um, well, compression is good, but also because it makes the latency on autoaggressive models uh, less painful, or, less, or just you, can, you don't have to worry about it. So on a smaller image, you don't want to have three channels. You just want a single ch representation, single channel, and, um, and, and just work with that. So instead of modeling this, you model this, and then you, you're going to find another way to go from here to here. And you just you find some way to do this. So I can encode a decoder type approach. So most of the big results recently have used this type of approach. They always compress the image into some representation that was more manageable. Um, before, do, before talking about the learning stuff, one way to do this, actually, you can do this just manually on the bits themselves. What you can imagine doing is you have, say, eight bits. Well, let's throw eight bits per value. Well, let's throw away the last five bits, and let's just, remove, let's just keep the first three bits. And what you actually get, you get an image like this, kind of pixelated, um, but definitely easier to model. And then you can first do this, and then you can also make the, take one pixel every fourth. It's just a very basic downsampling, not even nearest neighbors, not even linear, just, you know, just cutting out pixels type of downsampling. And, and, um, and you can get a small representation that is low bit and uh, substantially smaller. Now, with the learning approaches, you can probably do better, although there really isn't like a complete, I'm not aware of a complete full study of these things, and it's not clear. Um, but most approaches actually learn these representations. They don't just cut it down. But you could imagine going from here, removing pixels in every RGB channel, and then make it smaller, and you get some compression. And by the way, you can see the small image still looks like the big image. Like even if you do something so stupid like this, you can still do, I mean, stupid, so basic. Uh, you can still, like the image still looks like what you expect. So these latent images in a way that we cannot really see, but they are like, you know, downsampled images, basically. Uh, downsampled and highly compressed representations. And that's perfectly fine. Now, one actually uh, popular method to do, to do this is called uh, VQVAE. Um, it's what, so it's, this is not manual, this is actually learn, learning based. And what happens, you take your tensor of images, uh, RGB, you run it through a CNN. Um, again, this is a big image, so doing anything with attention will be painful, although some people have done some things here with attention. Um, you get a output of the encoder of a certain size. You take every channel uh, every point in the encoder and you match it to a number of vectors you had before, uh, which you're also training, co-training at the same time. You take the closest vector, then you take it, you put this, each of these vectors in the place of the output of the encoder and you feed it to the decoder. 
Because you have a finite size of vectors like 512, um, you're basically mapping your original image, say 256 by 256 times, say, uh, three channels times eight bits, into something that is, for example, 32, 32 by eight bits as well. You know, five, uh, sorry, by uh, nine bits. 512 values is going to be nine bits. So you're, you're mapping something like this size into basically a nine bit representation of a smaller, usually a smaller size. And you, you map this back. Uh, and, you, and you have a decoder that maps this back. This is basically like a fancy discrete downsampling operation. And you learn this back and forth. And you have a reconstruction loss. And then you have what is a code book loss that basically prevents um, uh, uh, the basically prevents the, the codes from changing too, too much. And then you also have an encoder loss, which prevents, uh, which makes sure that the encoder is close to existing codes. Um, this is actually a rather popular way of doing this discrete uh, representation uh, learning with this encoder decoder called VQAE. Um, one, one, so this is also rather more complicated than say the previous, the previous very basic thing. Um, uh, and could you have to train one more model for this? And then actually what is done often is that people don't use this decoder. Uh, they use, uh, they actually once, so they, 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 they run this to actually train this image. They run an autoregressive model on top of this representation, like I just showed you, often 1D actually. And then they upscale this with a yet another model. It could be a GAN or, or a diffusion model. So they don't actually run uh, often this decoder. So it's, it's a mix. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, so this embedding space is basically, okay, um, so it's a, it, well, it's called a vocabulary, a code book, but it's basically a bunch of vectors, um, literally vectors, like, and the length of these vectors is the same length as the last layer of your encoder, a bunch of numbers. And um, when, you, when your encoder generates a, uh, an, output, uh, an output vector for that position, uh, of the, of the representation, um, you do a uh, um, you, you 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 try you find in your code book the closest vector, and you replace it. See, so you you, you get a, you get a proposal for this vector, and then you search your code with the one that's closest using like cosine similarity or I guess just a dot product, um, and um, and then you replace it with that value. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like a dictionary. You like look up into a dictionary. Actually, it's called code book, dictionary, vocabulary. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of like embedding, um, yeah. It's kind of like embedding, it's basically like embedding every part of your image into one hot, like it's not one hot, but yeah, basically one hot index, like in, a, in, a, in like, a, like a word embedding, except it's a part of image embedding with this, with this thing. And because you have a finite number of this code book, 512, you, you have a discrete representation. It's a finite number of representations. So your image becomes like a vocabulary of different representations, which are very different vectors, which are sort of big, but there are only 512 of them. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's randomly initialized. So you know, it's, le it's jointly learned. So it's just a bunch of random values, and it's jointly learned, and the loss ensures that you have a construction loss, that you, and that you know, this gradient actually propagates. Sorry, I should have been clear. The gradient actually propagates on these embeddings, E, and it will upda update them as well with some penalty. You want to do it not too fast. Does that make sense? So, you, so these are random initially, like just like other weights, uh, and then you propagate and you update them, but only a little bit. And you want, it's a kind of like a game between wanting to make sure that the encoder actually matches existing code book values and um, updating those values still a little bit to make sure you, because they have to, they have to be updated, they have to be learned a little bit. It's like, a, this is like, um, thank you, Max. Yes, please. Yes. I can repeat it. Uh, it's, it's actually, so basically you get a gradient for these embeddings and then you just, uh, you just apply this gradient to, it's like straight through. Uh, it's not, of, it's not, I guess not completely differentiable indeed, but basically just straight through. Your gradient just go through the model and you just don't care. It's a bit, it's a bit nasty, but it's fine. It works. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, straight through works amazingly in deep learning. So just probably through. Yeah, it's, there's no problem. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is this latent space 
is meaningful and if it's meaningful how we can uh, how we can know what is the meaning of these new vectors yeah that's a great question um so it's it's that so it's definitely meaningful um as um because when we go back to the reconstruction we see this you know we see a pretty picture which looks a lot like the first usually a bit blurrier um the um, uh, you you know you it's it's probably in some way it's like a it's like it's like kind of the down sampling that i showed the small image but compressed better like the because you're learning the compression factor is a bit higher so maybe you have a smaller code book and a small number of positions to capture the same amount of information as a as a simple down sampling uh, linear or down sampling operator so it's not it's like we it's non linear so we, we can't just look at it and see images you won't do that of course it's impossible but um but it's quite analogous to to other to other methods uh, to 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 normal down sampling you can think of it as down sampling but just smarter just better done more compression Uh, so, for example, if we are looking for a specific properties for these images, so for my case, it's not images. I'm thinking about some kind of a structure with a specific properties. So I want to know, can we correlate this latent space with the specific properties of these structures? Then when we want to request a new structure, can we request a specific properties which is correlated with this latent space? So this, so I, okay, one thing that, we, that can be said is that these are not super semantically meaningful codes. Yes. So, you know, it isn't like, there's a whole, the, there's a whole field about representation learning with contrastive losses and all those things, which will probably give you semantically more meaningful representations, whether or not they're discrete. Um, that, that, you know, they're gonna capture, say, if there's a face, it will actually say kind of face in, the, in one of the code, code, one of the representations. Um, this is like, for example, for representation learning, for, for self-supervised learning or unsupervised learning, it's not, people don't usually use this type of encoding um, because semantically, it's kind of like a downsampling, but that doesn't really tell you the semantic properties of the image. It doesn't tell you if there's a car or it just says, okay, these pixels look a bit like a car and, you know, but it's not semantically that meaningful. So if you're looking for something semantically meaningful to correlate, to really understand and automatic like this, we're not there quite yet. Uh, and there's other better losses like self-supervised learning or or other things to do there. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, so, kind of. and the last question, sorry, uh, how we can uh, evaluate the accuracy of this model based on the distribution of latent space? Is there any method to do that or? Uh, the accuracy model based on what, sorry? So I think, so when we are training this, the, the whole procedure, encoder and decoder, then finally how we can evaluate the accuracy of the whole procedure is that um, well, um, well, you, you do get a loss, of course. You get this value here. Um, you, what, okay, what you can do is basically value the quality of the reconstructions. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of you want to have the, the smallest possible representation, the smallest possible code book and size of the image that gives you the best possible, the, 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 best poss the, the quality of the reconstruction that you care about. So if it becomes too smooth, I mean, if you make this one by one and you have a single vocabulary, if you just make this one by one and you have a single vector, uh, you won't be able to reconstruct a good image here. So, you know, it's like, you're, it's kind of like down sampling too much. Like you can't reconstruct an information uh, anymore. So this will be garbled or be bad or something. I see. Yeah. So it's, um, it's like a, you, so th th that's the reason why you can't really evaluate things because it's going to really depend on how big you make this. On the other hand, if you make this very large, like thousands or, or millions of, of, of vectors, then you're not compressing, yeah, right? Then you just, it's kind of the same thing. Just, you just sort of rehash this image as something else. Wow. But you. It, yeah, okay. I hope. Okay. By the way, there are, um, there are also much simpler ways of doing this. Uh, the code book is one way. But you know, discretization is affected by neural networks. You could imagine just discretizing the last channel of your image in like a simple uh, quantization encoder. And uh, sometimes simple variants of these are done and it's not clear what works uh, better. But so this is just one way to do this, uh, but it's very popular. So um, yes, so 
so these latent representations are at the core of some of the bigger um, papers of the cup last uh, couple of years that but so this is one part um, um, uh, so for example dali dali one was actually a based on autoregressive model um, so one, one part was to do this later representation and actually use a very simple, very big, very simple transformer to model both the text that comes into it and the images. And here the images were just linearized with some uh, 2D embeddings. And you can do this because you have attention and yeah. But, you know, these are, you, could, you could read the paper, go into detail about architecture. It's, 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 um, it's very big, very well executed, but there aren't so many unsurprising things. But what really made things to really work uh, and what this paper can be credited to, in a way, is to use a very, very large data set. So all the samples I've shown you so far, I believe, except for the first toilet, was, were built on about a million samples. And now you go, you go on the internet, you scrape all the data, you get 250 million pairs of text and images. And the nice thing you also have, you have like fluent text. You don't have a single label, you have a whole bunch of text, like a little sentence, uh, which allows you to obviously to modify these things in completely new ways and it makes people it makes people love these sort of applications. But you make the data set 250 million pairs instead of one million pairs and then the results look uh, much, much better. Another thing I haven't talked about but uh, Tim will, which is, which, is, which is great, is um, re-ranking. You know, you, you generate uh, a bunch of images and, you know, from your model uh, in the latent space and then first then you upsample your, dec your decoder and then you actually re-rank re re them uh, in various ways, and they will, they'll be discussed later. But you generate, say, 500, so if you just generate one on, on, on this prompt, I'm sorry you can't see it, but it, it, the idea kind of matters more, basically. If you generate just one candidate, you get these outputs, and then generate up to 512 candidates, you re-rank them with a, with a classifier, um, contrastively trained text-based uh, text um, text classifier, um, and you get much, much better candidates. Uh, what, is this sh what, is sh what, it, what this is showing is that uh, the highest, the, the most likely candidate or the first sample or whatever is not the best necessarily. You want to do, you want to get a whole bunch of outputs and re-rank them. Um, and again, this is fine for graphics. This is fine for graphics because you just want one great picture. Uh, so, so this re-ranking, so the data and the re-ranking are some of actually crucial innovations in a way of these latest um, blockbuster models. They've been so successful. So DALI was the first. Very recently, uh, DALI was by OpenAI authors, in part is by uh, Google authors. Recently, something very similar um, called Party was done. Again, you have an encoder for the text, two dogs running in a field. This, um, you have a decoder for the latency of the image. In this, this case, the image is actually just, just linearized. And uh, it's done on these representations that I just spoke about. And then you also have yet another model, it's a GAN actually, that takes this to, to, to the output space. And it's a bit of like a soup of ideas, but you know, very, very gigantic, like billion size soup. Um, and another important point is that it's actually done on 5 billion such, so, so not 250, 250 million, but actually if I read correctly, it's 5 billion text to image pairs. And it's, so it's you know, all of the internet. I mean, not all the internet, but a chunk of it. Um, and, and then you get, you know, amazing things like this. And this is based on state of the art today. Um, this, this could make you chuckle, it's really awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, a photo of a, of a frog reading a newspaper named Toad Day, you know, and it actually gets Toad Day right. Um, uh, and there's also a frog, there's a frog printed on newspaper too. So basically it starts understanding language incredibly deeply um, as well. And uh, a portrait of a statue of the Egyptian god uh, Anubis wearing aviator goggles, white t-shirt and leather jacket, the city of Los, uh, Los, Angeles, in, Los Angeles in the background, high res DSLR photograph, and um, you get this stuff. How many of you have, have actually played with DALI 2 or stable diffusion? Has anybody? Wow, I mean, yeah. Well, I'm just preaching to the choir. Um, and, and a high contrast photo of a panda riding a horse. Yeah. So, you know, the magic of deep learning makes this possible. The magic of the, you know, the curses of, uh, of overcoming curses of sparsity and dimensionality. Um, and lots and lots of data and compute 
uh, it's the usual story. We just say the same thing every time, um, make, make this type of things possible. So, well, but there's a bright future ahead. Okay, thanks, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Nothing time.